just keep you from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. Just a closer walk with Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Through this world of toil. And snare. If I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? None but thee, dear Lord, none but thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Life is old. Time for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely, O to thy kingdom shore, to thy shore. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Daily walking close to thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Well, good evening and welcome to everybody. It looks like the weather's passed and maybe we'll get in a, a full live stream service tonight. Just thank all of y'all for being here with us tonight and Hope everybody's okay and safe after the storms that came through. I know here just uh, about an hour ago, we had a pretty serious uh, line of thunderstorms come through and got a lot of rain and, and, and a lot of thunder and lightning, but we're still up and going. So we just praise the Lord for that and hope you are too. Just want to remind you of the prayer list, if you would, to keep up with it on uh, Facebook and be praying for those of our church family and friends. And remember the, uh, what's that girl's name, Lila? Uh, Lily, Lily Zalaki. Lily Zalaki. If you would remember her, she had to go back to Houston because of the uh, the headaches that she's been having. So if you would, just pray for that family. And uh, we just want to just lift up the Lord, uh, to the Lord, all of those of our friends and neighbors. And we want to remember to pray for each other and uh, pray for our country and the struggles that we're going through right now. If you have any prayer requests or any needs, or, or any praise reports, just feel free to email me or message me, either on Facebook or YouTube, either way, or call me, and uh, we will we'll pray with you, and we'll, we'll, we'll help you meet the needs that you have also and during this time that we're going through. 
So let's just give the Lord a, a word of prayer right now, and then we will sing another song, and then we'll get into our, our studies for tonight. Father, we just thank you for the time that we have here, Lord, to be with you, and Father, to be with these friends and family, Lord, as we worship you and as we seek to serve you with our heart and our soul and our mind. And Lord, I pray that you would just be with us tonight and just anoint us by your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we might speak your word and that that we might hear your word and that your word might be applied to our hearts by your Holy Spirit and that it might grow and have fruit in our lives. Lord, we thank you that the storm is past and Father, we pray that, that none were hurt and that there were, were no damages. And, and Lord, that everybody's just okay through this thing and we pray that you would just let your grace be on us and keep us. We ask for those on our prayer list Lord, we just lift them up to you and ask that you would just bless them in a special way and just let your healing grace and power come to them. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me turn the page here real quick. And uh, tonight, I wanted to sing uh, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. I've just been uh, singing that one and, and thinking about it today. And I just thought that's what we do. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more And the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair When the saved of us shall gather over on the other shore And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of His resurrection share. When His chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the sky, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. I've been singing that song since I was a kid. You'd think I'd know it by now. But sometimes those things happen. If you have your Bibles tonight, open to Isaiah chapter 40. We'll be in our studies in Isaiah tonight. And we will be looking at the at the middle to the last part of chapter 40. And you'll recall last week we started this last section in the book of Isaiah of his prophecies. And, and it began with in, in verse 40, in chapter 40 with verse 1. And it's, it's a beautiful verse. And it says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to her and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And then he goes on and he shows us and he tells us how that is to be accomplished, and that is to be accomplished through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so we see that not only can Jerusalem, the, the nation, the people, take comfort knowing that one day their Messiah will come, and when he comes back, they will recognize him this time as Messiah, but we also can take comfort in God's salvation because we know that the Messiah has come. 
and that he gave his life and he shed his blood for us. And so we have that same comfort that God promises to Israel. And we see in the promises, not only that he gives in, in verses three, four, and five, and verse six, but we see also the promises that he has given us in the New Testament through Jesus and then through the apostles that we share in this also. And then tonight, as we pick up in verse nine, the thing that we want to see and, and understand it, it tonight is the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God, that God is God, that God is the ruler of all things. And because of God's sovereignty, we can have assurance of salvation and we can have assurance of future blessing. Because God is sovereign, because God is God and he is the ruler of all things, we can have assurance of salvation and of future blessing. Now begin reading in verse nine of Isaiah chapter 40, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. And the Bible says, you who bring good news to Zion, go up to a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up and do not be afraid and say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Verse 10, see, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty hand. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and, and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. What a promise and what a passage. He begins by telling the messenger that is going to come and, and bring this message. He says, when you begin to proclaim that message, he says, you go up on a high mountain somewhere. You get up where everybody can hear you. And he says, when you give that message, you shout it out. Don't whisper. Don't be afraid you're going to offend somebody. Don't worry about anything. You shout out this message. And what is the message that he is to shout out to Jerusalem? What is the message that he is to shout out to God's people? Here is your God. Here is your God, O Jerusalem. O people of God, here is your God. Now remember, Jerusalem has been under persecution. Jerusalem has been under attack and under siege from the Assyrians and, and the Babylonians are soon to come right behind them. And all they've known is pressure. All they've known is struggle and persecution. Now, granted, it's because of their sin and their rebelliousness against God, but nevertheless, that's all they've known, and God is promising them a future blessing, and that's what we're going to see throughout most of this last section of the book of Isaiah, is the promise of the future blessing, the promise of a restored kingdom, and the promise of their Messiah being with them dwelling with them. And so he gives them assurance by saying, go and take this message. And when you take this message, shout it out to them and tell them, here is your God. And this is so important. It's so important, but it's going to be extremely important here in just a few minutes. And we probably won't get there tonight. But when God throws down a challenge to the false gods, and to the idols, it's going to be very important. But for right now, here is your God. That's the message. Here is your God. Now, I found it interesting in my studies that the Hebrew word that is translated God in verse 9 is Elohim. Now, that's just a Hebrew word. It does have meaning, but for you and me, it has special meaning. And the reason why it has special meaning, now remember, we're talking about the sovereignty of the Lord God. He is God. He is ruler over all of his creation. When he says, here is your God, speaking to the children of Israel, speaking to us by prophecy, he says, here is your Elohim. You know where else that word was used? Genesis chapter one and verse one. 
In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. You know what he's telling us? He's telling us, look, don't fret. Don't worry about what you're going through. Don't worry about what's happening to you because here is your God. And not only is he your God, he is the ruler. He is the creator and the sustainer of all life. God is sovereign. And because God is sovereign, we can know that no matter what we face and no matter what we go through, no matter where we are on God's prophetic timeline, that God is in control. And we can be assured not only of our salvation here and now, but the blessing that God has promised us in eternity in heaven with him. We can be sure of those things because God is sovereign. Look at verse 12 in chapter 40. In verse 12, he says this, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who has done that? Was it Dagon, the god of the, the Philistines? Was it Molech, the god that, that some of them, the Canaanites, burnt their children to? Has any of those gods done anything like that? No, only the sovereign God. Only the God that you and I serve. Only the God that assures us salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 28 in chapter 40, the same chapter. He says, God says, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives us one other promise here. He says that he is the creator of the ends of the earth and he will not grow tired or weary. Folks, that tells us that not only did God create the earth back in Genesis chapter one in the beginning, God, but that tells us that he knows the end of the earth. He knows where it's going and he knows what's going to happen. He knows what Revelation chapter 21 and 22 is and he never grows tired. He never grows weary so we can be sure that the end of time, the promises, the future that he has promised us will come to pass because he will be there to fulfill his word and his promise to us. Now look if you would at verse 10 when we talk about that. He says this, he says, see the sovereign Lord comes with power. Now, this is a different word here. He doesn't use Elohim here when he says sovereign Lord. He uses the word Adonai Yahweh. Adonai Yahweh. In some other places, it's translated mighty God. Some of the other translations use that. But he's talking here about God's power. He told us that God was Elohim, that he was the creator of all things, and now he's telling us that God is the all-powerful God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power. He rules with a mighty arm, and watch this. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. Now, when I read that, I understood the reward part. I understand reward. That makes sense. When, when, when Jesus comes back, when, when he calls us out through the rapture, the first thing we'll do is stand before the Bema seat of Christ and, and we'll receive reward for the works, for the things that we've done in this life. But I didn't understand the recompense. That's not a word that I use every day. It's not a word that I'm familiar with, so I had to look it up. And what it means, first of all, is it means to award compensation to or for. So it's a, a judicial thing. It, it, it's like a lawyer or like a court, and something has happened, and that court awards you for 
what has happened in your life. The second definition is the definition that I really want to focus on. And that second definition says this, it says to amend for damage or loss. Recompense, according to the dictionary, means to amend for damage or for loss. And I think that this second definition is more of what Isaiah has in mind there. Now, why do I say that? Why do I think that it means to make amends for, for something damaged or lost? Well, if you would, turn to the book of Joel. And, and I want to show you a couple of things in the book of Joel. And Joel starts out in chapter 1 talking about Israel. Again, their, their unbelief, their, their rebellion. And because of that, they've come under the judgment of God and armies have invaded them, the Assyrians, the Babylonians and various ones and have, have invaded them. And God likens what happens to them. He says in verse six of chapter one, a nation has invaded my land, a mighty army without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. Now remember, he said my land. God says a nation has invaded my land. He says it has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off the bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. So this is what has happened to Israel, to Jerusalem, because of her sin and because of God's judgment on them. And you might remember verse 4 more. You probably heard verse four used and preached on a few times. And it says this, it says what the locust swarm has left, the great locust have eaten. And what the great locust have left, the young locust have eaten. And what the young locust have left, other locust have eaten. So what God is telling them is that in their judgment, in their persecution, in their trials and sufferings that they went through in this earth, they lost basically everything. Everything was taken from them because of the things that they suffered and the things that they endured because they were God's children. But God's promise is one of recompense amends made for what was lost or damaged. So turn to Joel chapter two and begin reading in verse 18. It says this, then the Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. And the Lord replied to them, I am sending you grain and new wine and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. I will drive the northern horde far from you, pushing it into a parched and a barren land. Its western ranks will drown in the Dead Sea, and its western ranks, its eastern ranks, and western ranks in the Mediterranean Sea. And its stench will go up, its smell will rise. So God is telling them, all of those things that you lost because of the invasion of these armies, I'm going to restore it. You have been persecuted. You have suffered because you were my people, because you were in my land and Jerusalem is my city. And God says, I'm going to restore every bit of it. And I'm going to destroy those that persecuted you. Now, drop on down to verse 23. And oh, this, this gets good. Drop verse 23. He says, then be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God for he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The, flesh, the threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. Now watch verse 21 and remember verse four of chapter one. He says this, I will repay you for the years the locust have eaten, the great locust and the young locust, the other locust and the locust swarms, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full and you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you and never again will my people be ashamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God and there is no other and never again will my people be ashamed. 
What a promise. What was the message in Isaiah chapter 40? Israel, here is your God. What is the message that God brings to them? I am coming with my reward and with my recompense. And all that you have lost because of the suffering that you went through in this world, because of me and my name, I will restore everything. Now, that was a promise to Israel. That was a promise that the prophets made to Israel and God specifically said Israel and specifically said Jerusalem. So what does that have to do with you and me? What is the application? When Christ comes back for us, will it be with reward and with recompense? Let's see what God's word says. Do you remember Romans chapter eight and verse 18? And Paul says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Whew. Does that sound like recompense? I think so. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings, our present sufferings in this life, what we're going through, what we are enduring for the name of Jesus Christ are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. The glory that is to be revealed in us has to do not only with our salvation but also with our suffering for Christ in this life and what will be revealed and happen to us in the future life, in the promise that he has given us. Now remember, in this life, Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. So that's Part of our salvation, just like with Israel being God's chosen people and Jerusalem being God's chosen city and chosen land, they suffered if for no other reason than just the fact that they were God's chosen people. And now you and I in the New Testament, we have the word of God. We have the word of Jesus Christ spoken through the apostle Paul that not only was it given to us, to receive salvation, to believe on him, but it is also given to us to suffer for his name and for his sake, just like Jerusalem did. Now, I know that's not the best news in the world, and that's not something you want to tune into, and that's why the TV preachers are so popular, because they don't preach to you the whole counsel of God. They don't preach to you the whole gospel. All they preach is the good stuff. Well, folks, there's more to it than that. Christ has called us to suffer for his name. And the way that we handle suffering, the way that we handle persecution in this life, the way that we endure it will have great bearing on our reward in heaven. The way that we endure persecution and deal with the suffering will have bearing on our reward in heaven. Back in Romans chapter 8, look if you would at verse 16 and 17. Paul says this, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Now let me stop right here. Mark this down and get it straight in your head. We are not talking about salvation and losing one salvation. That's not what we're talking about. We are talking about Christians after they are saved and what happens to them in this life because they are saved. And that's what he says. He says, now the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Not talking about salvation. We're talking about what you do after you're saved. And then he goes on and he says this. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Now you hear that? Paul says that we are his children 
And if we are his children, then we are heirs. We are co-heirs with Christ. That means that heaven is ours. The glory, the, the future promise is ours. But he goes on and he says this, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And so what he's telling us is in heaven, at the Bema seat of Christ, our reward and our recompense will be based on how we live in this life. The things that we suffer, how we endure that suffering. Do we endure that suffering as the disciples did in the book of Acts? They counted it joy that they were worthy, counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. Remember after they had been beaten and, and, and cast out of the, the temple and told not to preach in the name of Jesus Christ anymore, they went home rejoicing because they had been counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ? Or do we suffer for the name of Christ like a lot of us do? And I can't believe that's happening to me. I can't believe God would let that happen to me. Well, folks, God's already given us the promise. God's already told us that if we are his, we will suffer for his name in this world. But he has also given the promise that he will recompense us. <laughs> It'll be worth it. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 4. I want to share another passage with you and share you some things that we are taught here. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. And he says this, Peter teaching us, he says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So the first thing that Peter tells us, he says, is, is when these things happen, don't be surprised. Why? Because Jesus already told us. He's already told us that we're going to suffer. If you're a child of God, you're going to suffer persecution. If you're living holy and right and just before God in this world, you're going to suffer for it. And Peter says when it happens, he said, don't be surprised because you already know it's going to happen. Verse 13, but rejoice Inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Now, two things. First of all, he says, rejoice, be happy, rejoice, inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Number one, know that when you suffer, as a Christian, you are suffering just like your Lord and Savior did. Number two, and we're going to see this even stronger, know that when you suffer as a Christian, it's not you that they're after, it's Jesus Christ in you. But the second thing that I want to point out of this verse, and, and the, the, the real thing you need to get and understand in the NIV is that word overjoyed. He says this, he says, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Now, overjoyed, that joy is one thing, but overjoyed. And who's going to be overjoyed? Those who participate in the sufferings of Christ. The other translations, the ESV says rejoice and be glad. The NAS says rejoice with exaltation. The King James Version says glad also with exceeding joy. So every translation gives the idea that it is more than just normal joy and rejoicing. So I get the idea taken together with all of these things that we have looked at and all of these things that, that Isaiah and Paul and Peter have taught us that when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, some are going to be joy and some are going to be overjoyed. Some are going to rejoice, but others are going to rejoice and be glad. Some are going to rejoice, but others will rejoice with exaltation. Some will be glad, but others will be glad with exceeding joy. Now, why? How can that be? And, and, and just let me ask this question. Is this taught in other places in the Bible or 
am I making this up? Well, I want to show you that this is taught all the way through scripture. 